Okay. Um, I, too, would like very much to thank Carlos Prieto and the comrades of Traficantes for organizing this terrific event um, and for inviting me to participate. Uh, it's really great to be here, uh, let's say, at a very interesting political time for militants and leftists everywhere. Interesting times. Okay, I, get, I was asked to speak about the Great Recession, which continues to today, and I'm and to try to explain it, and that's what I'm going to try to do uh, in the time I have. When the Great Recession hit in 2007-8, it was widely interpreted as a purely financial collapse, a crisis of Wall Street, not Main Street. From Fed Chair Ben Bernanke on down, economists of all stripes, with comparatively few exceptions, not only focused on the financial sector, but denied the need to look beyond finance to understand the meltdown. They insisted that until the financial crisis began to affect it, the real economy was doing well, the so-called fundamentals quite strong. In other words, it was the financial crisis that was seen as responsible for the problems of the real economy for the recession that followed. But in my opinion, this account of the Great Recession, the world crisis, put things precisely backwards and could not be more misleading. So what I'll contend in this talk is that the crisis of 2007-8, which is still with us, has deep roots in long-term problems in the real economy. I'll argue in turn that these difficulties in the real economy provide the indispensable context for understanding the rise of finance, the inherent weakness of the long financial expansion that gathered steam from around 1980, and ultimately the financial crisis itself as well as why the Great Recession has been so lasting, now six years, extending right into the present. So the bottom line is that the, that the advanced capitalist economies led by the US have been experiencing steadily declining economic dynamism decade by decade, business cycle by business cycle, in terms of all the major macroeconomic indicators going back at least to the early 70s, with the partial exception of the bubble years of the later 1990s. Um, I hope people have the uh, handout. I don't. Yes, I do. Um, if you could take a look uh, at the number one, uh, the table declining economic dynamism, which lays out the basics of decline. And you can see as you read from left to right, uh, pretty consistently, column after column, the results are worse and worse, and the last column is what we're living through today. Indicatively, the last business cycle of 2001 to 7, leading into the Great Crash, was up to that point far and away the weakest of the post-war period in the U.S., Germany, Japan, Western Europe more generally. In the U.S., between 2000 and 2007, growth was the slowest for the whole of the post-war period. The increase of plant and equipment far below the previous worst, wages for production and non-supervisory workers flat or declining, and perhaps most telling, there was no increase at all in private sector employment. And all this was a case, despite the biggest government-sponsored stimulus to demand, the biggest experiment in Keynesian deficits in peacetime history, Reagan-esque U.S. budget deficits, rock-bottom central bank interest rates, and above all, of course, the record-smashing household borrowing and deficit spending, a point to which I'll return. So this is something that may, uh, people might consider when they think of the likelihood of a Keynesian stimulus very much transforming the situation. We've already had the biggest in the post-war period um, with very little results, so it's a good question what would happen if it was tried, as uh, we're told by people like Krugman, uh, that it should be today. 
The growth in the world economy as a whole looks at first sight somewhat better, highlighted by China's spectacular expansion and the dramatic growth of the BRICS. In fact, during these years, many analysts were saying that the less developed uh, uh, countries had achieved a breakthrough, finally closing the gap between themselves and the advanced capitalist states and taking their rightful place in the global system. But the fact is that the uptick in growth of the world um, economy during the last business cycle before the crisis was only made possible by a, a titanic wave of borrowing and consumption in the United States that was entirely unsustainable because based in an unsustainable bubble in the U.S. housing market. Just how unsustainable was dramatically revealed when the housing bubble burst and the economy around the world, even worse in most of the less developed countries, plunged into the crisis that's enveloping us now. So if you look at uh, the second uh, page, uh, you get a look at uh, world GDP over the post-war era. How then are we to explain the long downturn that issued in this great recession and continues today? I'll just say flat out, since there's not a lot of time to kind of hedge around, um, which would be my proclivity, uh, that as I see it, the basic source of the problem is a systematic fall, system-wide fall, and failure to recover the rate of profit, a development that's all the more remarkable in view of the spectacular drop in real wage growth throughout this period. So if you look at um, line graph three, uh, you get a first uh, glance at that decline. Uh, partly compensated by fallen wages. What then has been the cause of the reduction and failure to recover of the rate of profit? In my view, it's fundamental, though not its only source has been the decline in the rate of profit in manufacturing system-wide, itself attributable to a persistent tendency to the reproduction of overcapacity in global manufacturing industries, which goes back as far as the late 1960s. Essentially what happened is that over the length of this whole period, the manufacturers of one after another newly emerging economic power have been able to make use of the latest technology borrowed from so-called West in combination with relatively low wages to manufacture for export goods that were already being produced for the world market, but at a lower price. Germany and Japan in the 60s and 70s, the East Asian Knicks and Southeast Asian Tigers in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and finally, of course, the Chinese behemoth uh, in the 1990s and 2000s with its devastating China price. Put another way, what these economies produced tended to be redundant rather than complementary for the world division of labor. The result was too much supply compared to demand in one industry after another, forcing down prices and in that way profit rates. Meanwhile, the great corporations that were experiencing the squeeze on their profit rates, mainly in the core, so-called incumbents, technical economic term, refused to meekly leave their lines. They tended to fight back rather than switch by trying to improve, falling back on their fixed capital, especially their proprietary capital to remain competitive. I mean by that, the network of suppliers they had, their long-established customers, and above all, their capacity to innovate. But investing in improved production in already oversupplied lines tended to make things worse, exacerbating overcapacity and keeping profit rates from reviving. Bottom line is that there continued to be too rapid, too much entry into manufacturing and too slow and insufficient exit with the result that global economic system experiencing intensifying overcapacity making for downward pressure on prices and profit rates for the whole period. So you have to think, see that for the whole period you're having one tendency leading to downward 
profit rates, and this is the continual entry and, fair and slow exit of firms in um, manufacturing. And on, if you uh, want to take a look on pages four and five, there's some further um, indications of this. Uh, perhaps uh, graph five is most indicative because it shows that the action in the rate of profit is in manufacturing. Non-manufacturing profit rate, which is the bottom line, barely changes at all. So this gives you an indication that it's there, continuing pressure in that sphere that is responsible in the first instance for uh, downward, um, the downward pressure on the rate of uh, profit. Now, it's a continuing downward pressure on prices and the rate of profit that takes us back to the real economy, that accounts for the steadily weakening of the real economy, and it did so through making for a persistent and profound weakness of aggregate demand. So the aggregate demand and its weakness is a link between falling profit rate and the weakening in all these other variables in the rate of profit. So, declining aggregate demand or declining pressure of aggregate demand is the immediate cause of persistent weakness in the economy, even if falling profitability is sort of the ultimate problem. So, falling profitability now does bring about the weakness of demand, and it does so through three main channels, or three main mechanisms. First, the reduction in the rate of profit meant that firms had smaller and smaller surpluses, kind of just another word for profits, available to them to invest and, and reduce incentives to do so. Can't make as much money, you're getting uh, less surpluses to expand. So they found themselves to reduce the growth of their purchases of plant and equipment, as well as hiring of additional workers. Simply put, there was steadily declining investment, uh, you know, a, a sort of at the core of what's been wrong with the world economy. And if you look at graph uh, six, uh, you can see that fairly dramatically. Second, and perhaps most obvious for, for any human being outside of the capitalist class that lives through this period, in order to restore their profits, capitalists unleashed a vicious assault on all of the institutions of the labor movement so as to cut back ever more deeply on the growth of compensation to their workers. Slowdown in wage growth was magnified by the reduction in the growth of employment, and this made for an even greater deceleration of total wage growth or wage increase in the aggregate. So this is uh, illustrated in number seven, and also number seven. Uh, you may have seen a slight glitch in my numbering, but I hope we can get beyond that. So the, uh, those two uh, pages uh, are, the, are an initial indicator of the problem of wage growth, the result of the permanent empl employer's offensive cutting back on consumer demand. Thirdly, to support the profitability and competitiveness of their, quote, their corporations, and we know the governments consider them their corporations, uh, governments everywhere reduce the increase in social spending, an initial indicator there is on the page, page seven, which is called Immediate Successful Employers Offensive. So what we have is as a result of the fall in the rate of profit, big downward pressure and aggregate de demand as a result of the fall in investment demand, the fall in consumer demand, and the fall in government demand. So that's what has been behind the permanent and intensifying pressure that we've all felt for decades. Now, under normal circumstances, intensifying overcapacity, making for reduced uh, uh, rates of profit leading to difficulties of aggregate demand 
could and did give rise to recession or de uh, serious recession or depression. And that had generally been the pattern before 1945. But from the late 60s and early 70s, right up until the onset of the global crisis of 2007-9, this outcome, the normal outcome from a fall in the rate of profit leading to demand problems was prevented and the economy enabled to advance at least slowly by way of ever greater borrowing and deficit spending, both public and private. Borrowing and deficit spending that was ultimately dependent directly or indirectly upon the governments of the advanced capitalist states. Simply put, the relentless growth of debt in ever more risky and ever more baroque forms made possible by governments provided the ever increasing boost to demand that were needed to sustain economic stability from the end of the post-war boom around 1973 to the Great Recession of 2007-9. And it, you can see, if you take a look at the, uh, the graph uh, number eight, you see the uh, US total borrowing and debt outstanding over that long period. And uh, fairly, you can see pretty sharply what is making for a discontinuity with the Great Recession. Um, that uh, failure of borrowing and growth of debt to continue. Now, as we know, the initial form taken by the government sponsored subsidies to demand beginning in this uh, way back in the late 60s and early 70s. These was classical Keynesian deficit spending accommodated, as they say, by reduced interest rates. Nevertheless, although Keynesian deficits did make for greater stability, precluding the worst types of economic crisis, over time they also made for further economic deceleration. Keynesian sub subsidies to demand did stop profitability uh, from falling past a certain point, especially by keeping prices up, while the accompanying reduction in interest rates enabled greater borrowing. In these ways, more firms than would otherwise were enabled to stay in business and, ex and expand. But Keynesian deficits in accommodating interest rates also stopped the profit rate from really recovering because they prevented the shakeout of high cost, low profit firms that were needed to really reinvigorate capital accumulation. That shakeout never happened. And the outcome was that over time, the economy was able to keep turning over, but also became less responsive to any given amount of stimulus, i.e. the growth of borrowing. In the parlance of the day, the stimulus could provide ever less bang for the buck. That term has applied uh, continually throughout the period right uh, to, our, uh, to our day. So for the whole long period between 73 and 1995, the political economy essentially traded off greater dynamism for greater stability. You had no great recession, no great depression, but you did have a steady descent toward stagnation, which I think some uh, even of the neoclassical economists are beginning to become aware. Um, this is the background to a critical discontinuity in the pattern of post-war capital accumulation, which took place during the early, early 1990s. That was the brief attempt by the advanced capitalist countries, increasingly influenced by neoliberal ideology, to break the economy's addiction to borrowing, specifically the Keynesian deficit spending by governments that had reached unprecedented levels across the advanced capitalist countries. So as you, as you may remember, beginning in 1993, Clinton administration in the US, followed by Western Europe in the run-up to the Maastricht Treaty for a single currency, moved with great fanfare to balance the budget. That was the, or, that was the slogan of the day. It's going to solve all the problems 
that had supposedly been created by government intervention in the period up to that time. The theory was that by decreasing government borrowing, you'd op open up a broader space for private borrowing and capital accumulation. But as it turned out, while the reduction of the government deficits that came with the balancing of budgets could not but that ending of the growth of debt, balancing budgets, stopping the Keynesian demand man management, so to speak, had to bring about a big reduction in aggregate demand. New investment and new hiring by the private sector failed to fill the gap. So on the contrary, between 1991 and 1995, when this all happened, when, when we had the um, Republican President uh, Clinton uh, telling us all about the advantages of the uh, balanced budget and his economists showing the way for the Democrats to um, bring about a political reordering uh, in the U.S., the, we get the worst growth performance of any comparable period since 1950. Global economies, profound underlying weakness and dependence on the growth of borrowing in the U.S. could not have been more apparent. The result was that now the world economy in general and U.S. policymakers in particular faced a huge dilemma. What was going to drive the economy forward? The economy had proved incapable of growing without ever greater injections of credit. But at the same time, any return to traditional government deficits had been politically ruled out by the growing commitment to budget balancing and economic regulation by the free market in general. This is what opened the way to a new form of deficit spending, what you might call asset price Keynesianism, i.e. the essay, essays in bubblenomics in the 1990s and 2000s that provided the ground for the spectacular growth of finance, the apparent explosion of financial profits, and in turn, the great financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. So, this, this we get Please. a switch. The, the, both parties in the U.S. turned to the political support of finance, and this form of stimulus could not have been more favorable to that. So from the 1990s into the early 2000s, there took place an historic shift. Borrowing and deficit spending, the increase in aggregate demand that the economy needed to keep it growing, willy-nilly had to be undertaken by private parties. That is, private corporations and private households, instead of governments. Corporations had been weakened, as we saw, by the reduction in their profitability. Households, by sharp slowdown of wage growth. But both firms and households were, despite this weakness, now nonetheless unable to step up their borrowing, and that, that way they're spending by way of huge, largely fictitious increases in their wealth, made possible by huge speculative run-ups in asset prices, asset price bubbles, nurtured by the easy credit and deregulation policies of the Fed and other U.S. agencies. So, in this new regime, when the expansions of the economy or the run-up of financial markets ran into trouble, Following the example set by Japan in the late 1980s, the Fed would intervene to reduce short-term interest rates. This reduction in the cost of credit would enable financial investors to step up their borrowing in order to correspondingly increase their purchases of financial assets and thereby drive up asset prices, asset markets. So you can see now this, in this, quote, neoliberal period, where the market is supposed to be receding, the government is now playing a perhaps more central place than ever before. The increase in asset prices supported by the government would make for the increase in on-paper wealth of corporations and households, and this, in turn, would increase their qualifications to borrow in the eyes of the banks. Corporations and households would thus be enabled to increase their own debts and in that way to finance their own increased deficit spending on 
plant and equipment in the case of corporations and on consumer goods in the case of households. In this way, they secured the wherewithal to provide the demand to keep the economy growing. Corporations, investment, um, households, consumption, based on the apparent increase in their wealth driven by these asset price bubbles. The so-called wealth effect of rising, first rising equity prices, then rising housing prices, secured by the easy credit policies of the Fed, made possible the success of investment goods led and consumer goods led expansion of the 1990s and the 2000s. So the fundamental point is that these speculative bubbles, ultimately supported by the Fed, were not just froth. They were indispensable to counter the weakening of the economy and particularly the weakening of aggregate demand by making possible record borrowing and spending by corporations and households instead of the government at a point when sufficient government borrowing and spending, that is Keynesian policies, were politically set off the agenda. There was, of course, a fundamental underlying problem, a fatal catch, so to speak. Given that the profit rate had failed to recover, and given as well the corresponding weakness of the real economy, the asset price run-ups that were driven by low Fed reserve interest rates had no justification. As a result, neither the corporate investment boom based on the rising stock market prices of the 90s, nor the household consumption boom based on rising housing prices of the 2000s had any independent foundation and soon came to grief. So when the stock market bubble burst, corporations could no longer borrow and invest, the investment boom collapsed. The economy tanked. When the housing bubble burst, the households had to cease borrowing and spending, and the consumption boom inevitably collapsed, and the economy entered into the Great Recession. Now, there's not really time at all to narrate the essays in bubblenomics that dominated the 90s and 2000s, so I'll confine myself to bringing out a few what I see as the salient points and try to um, be, be quick as possible of bringing this uh, to a conclusion. Um, first, the 90s. As we know, the, s the stock market took off uh, in the mid, around 1995, and by the end of 96, Alan Greenspan was making his famous warning about irrational exuberance and the dangers of bubbles. But as we also know, at the same time, in the privacy of the meetings of the Fed, Fed Greenspan was explicitly acknowledging, and this is pretty interesting about that they knew what they were doing, uh, that yes, there was a bubble. And yes, the in, uh, bubble could easily be curbed by increasing margin requirements for stock market investors, i.e. making for a decline in borrowing rather than the rise in borrowing that was driving the bubble. Yet Greenspan argued, in effect, that the, in view of the uncertain effect state of the economy, it would be dangerous to deflate the equity price bubble because to do so might have the effect of stopping the economic expansion in its tracks. The result was that the Greenspan Fed did just the opposite of reigning in the runaway stock market bubble. And between, we know that in the second half of the 90s, the Fed basically refused to raise its interest rates and there was the famous Greenspan put, meaning that uh, the Fed would intervene every time the stock market wobbled a bit. So equity prices rose as, as they hadn't since the 20s, and this had the effect of massively increasing the so-called uh, stock market value the, uh, of these corporations, uh, the on-paper value of the businesses, hugely increasing their fitness to borrow, and in turn to invest and employ. The result was the new economy boom of the later 1990s. Above all, a boom of investment in new plant and equipment and new workers, especially in information technology based on massive borrowing by corporations. So the Fed taking responsibility for driving the economy and went into overdrive, as people may remember, in the late, uh, at the last couple years of the 90s when there was, in, in 1998, already a freezing up of finance, which provides, in a sense, the, um, 
the first run through um, of the, or the, you might say, the dress rehearsal for the great crisis of 2007-9. Greenspan stopped it by huge cuts in interest rates and the economy uh, took off. The problem was, though, that the high-tech asset price bubble endowing high-tech firms with endless opportunities to borrow and raise money by issuing stocks channeled money into lines where there was no hope of making a profit and added money to lines where there was already existing overcapacity. The result to exacerbate overcapacity in manufacturing and high-tech lines outside manufacturing like telecommunications and drove down profits at the very time the stock market was reaching historic highs. As former Fed Chair Paul Volcker pithily summed up the situation in the summer of 1999, the fate of the world economy is now totally dependent on the growth of the U.S. economy, which is dependent on the stock market, whose growth is dependent upon about 50 stocks, half of which have never reported any earnings whatsoever. As we know, the high-tech bubble burst in, the, in 2000, share price, prices plunged, plunged, and the wealth effect went into reverse, reveal, revealing the new economy's feet of clay. Be, uh, between, 2000 and, between July 2000 and July 2001, according to a study by the Wall Street Journal, losses by the 4,200 companies on the NASDAQ stock exchange, quote, wiped out all the profits of the five years of the high-tech boom, as one Wall Street veteran put it, what this means is that with the benefit of hindsight, the late 1990s never happened. So uh, in the wake of the, the co collapse of the uh, equity price bubble, rate of profit for non-financial corporations fell to its lowest level the post-war period. Um, indeed, as it turned out, over the next seven years, which led into the Great Recession, non-financial corporations went on what amounted to an investment and employment strike. For the, and this lasted right into the Great Recession. They had surplus productive capacity that was a legacy of that stock market bubble and its stimulus uh, to um, misinvestment. And above all, you got in manufacturing and high-tech lines the need to get rid of overcapacity, which these firms did at a dizzying pace, making for devastating fall to demand. Between 2000 and 2007, the manufacturing sector eliminated three million jobs. Overburdened by debt, also a legacy of the equity price run-up, non-financial corporations essentially ceased to borrow for the purposes of spending on the means of production for the next half decade. Finally, to restore their profits, and this was a continual theme of the last 20 years, non-financial corporations kept their wages flat, intensifying labor. This made for some revival or support for the rate of profit, but it had the effect of even further undercutting the growth of aggregate demand, further discouraging investment and the increase in employment. In effect, non-financial corporations defected from their responsibility for the economy's growth. A stunning expression, I would say, of the weakness of the economy. The upshot was that during the entire business cycle leading into the Great Recession, the function of driving the economy was left willy-nilly in the hands of households, which ended up undertaking the consumption and non-residential investment that kept the economy turning over throughout the whole period. How they were able to do so, despite what we already know of the failure of wages and employment to grow, was the obvious question, and the answer was to be found in the second round of asset price Keynesianism, also known as the housing bubble. I'm going to just rush through this to get to the conclusion of the to get to the conclusion uh, on the period of that since since the crash. But I want to just say a couple of words about this. So. What, what happened there, as you, would, as you know, the low interest rates of the Fed made possible the household borrowing that made possible the, household, the housing purchases that uh, essentially uh, made possible the growth in wealth in the form of households that allowed for the consumption uh, that drove the economy. And so rising housing prices second round of 
uh, asset rights Keynesianism made possible this new wealth that made possible consumption that made possible the whole of the growth in the economy 2000-2007. 90% of the households expenditures, I'm sorry, household expenditures accounted for 90% of the growth uh, in the economy uh, by way of purchases of consumption goods and, and also residences and associated uh, furniture and so forth, the type tied to residents. According to the Moody's, the run-up in housing accounted for fully 30% of the growth of GDP between 2000 and 2006, and 50% of the growth of employment. Now, it's at this point, and I really um, have to just say, is at this point to keep the housing bubble going, you had to bring in new investors into the market. By 2003 already, all the so-called conforming mortgages, the height of uh, sales of conforming mortgages, that is normal mortgages with uh, the backed up by the 20% uh, down payment, blah, 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 blah decent salaries and so forth. Everybody who could do that practically had effectively done it. And so the only way the economy could grow would be to bring in new, um, new uh, 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 purchasers into the housing market. And this is where the subprime market uh, opens up. And it is, again, the creation of Greenspan who says, why are we worrying about, um, why are we worrying about the uh, 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 using the old-fashioned fixed interest rates we can turn to adjustable rates, bring in a lot more people because now with the new uh, mortgages, they will be governed by the Fed. They will have interest rates that are determined by the short-term interest rates uh, of the Fed. And uh, we, the Fed will therefore, by controlling directly the housing market, will be able to uh, support a further expansion of the economy, opening the way to vast increase in the uh, in the vast increase of entrance into the mortgage market by a working class people who could never have afforded to do that. The, how could that? So what we get is a vast increase in the housing market made possible by subprime mortgages that allows the economy to grow up until 2006 to 2007. So it's that subprime boom that drives the economy. But the question that gets raised, and, and uh, I try to deal with it in, in a second, is how could it be the implicit problem here that's not always seen is how, well, on the one hand, yeah, it's easy to see why people would take these uh, cheap mortgages to be able to get houses they couldn't get before. But the flip side of it is why would anyone lend to them? Why would financial investors uh, lend to people with such a likelihood they would not pay it back? And here's where Wall Street enters in and the famous, uh, famous uh, mortgage-backed securities and CDOs. The problem is that the flip side, the flip side of those very uh, low interest rates that make possible the entry into the economy for working class people, keep the housing bubble going. These low interest rates cause impossible problems for investors, hedge funds, city governments, you name it, pension funds. They have to make certain returns if they don't they're going to be out of business. So the way is open to them if they can find an asset that will yield more than the normal rate, which is so low because interest rates have been driven down so low, they will be open to buying them. And this is, of course, what happened when the banks, the, uh, sorry, the Wall Street banks packaged these crappy, uh, subprime mortgages into the securities we call mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations. This were these were bought up 
hungrily by financial investors because they offered such high rates of return. High rates of return, how can they offer high rates of return? The only way they could offer high rates of return is because of the risks that were associated with them. But these risks were put to the side, ignored, and countered by the, um, the ratings companies which gave these, these um, uh, assets AAA ratings. Of course, the, these could only have been purchased in the, in the wake of a bubble mentality, expectation that, well, if things go bad, we'll be able to sell off our, 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 um, our goods, I mean our, our assets, before we get burned. Um, and this is, of course, set the way, opened the way for um, the ultimate uh, b a bust. But the, really, the most paradoxical fact in this whole, in this whole development is that you might ask, who are the biggest purchasers of these crappy mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations. You can guess it happens to be the great banks themselves, the, the Wall Street banks. How could they, how could they do this? The whole theory of the boom had, of the bubble had been you originate to distribute. You, you buy these mortgages, I mean you, you, you package these mortgages, i.e the great banks, and you sell them on. You sell them on uh, to various financial investors. But what happened was the great banks did not do that. They held them. Obviously, the housing bubble crashed, and the banks were paralyzed, and it was the paralysis of the banks that then was at the core of the which root, rooted ultimately, of course, in that weak economy that was at the root of the um, Great Recession. So last points. What's, what's going on since then? Big thing we know, huge bailout. Makes possible a new expansion. Tr I believe $14 trillion was spent to bail out the banks. What happened then? you get actually an extreme case of what's, what we've seen for the, and, what we, and this is what we're facing today. Extreme case of what happened in, every, in every, the recent cycles uh, driven by asset price bubbles. On the one hand, firms refuse to invest. They try to recover their rates of profit, understandably, cutting employment, cutting wages, and they get some gain in profitability. But what is the cost? A collapse in demand. They don't have any reason, therefore, to invest. What do they do with their money? They, uh, they use it to consume, to buy stocks, to put in, to pay themselves a higher dividends, to pay, have, their, have the companies buy back their stocks and allow them to make financial profits. So nothing going on in the real economy. Indeed, the corporations are in effect handing back their capacity to invest to the rich. Flip side, how do we get the economy going? They explicitly say we're going to use bubble nomics. We're going to keep interest rates below zero. This is going to allow financiers to buy assets and drive up asset prices. Well, one half of that thing did happen. We've seen asset prices rising in every single line from art to, to, um, to equities to bonds. Everything going up. But uh, in, in essence, the second and key part of that stimulus, the second part of the bubble nomics, the so-called wealth effect, has not happened. There's no employment. There's no investment. And instead, just rising asset prices, particularly rising stock prices that are dependent on squeezing workers, a process that has its limits, 
and which we are beginning to see right now. So on the one hand, a corporate economy that doesn't invest or employ, it only squeezes its assets, sends them back to the rich. On the other hand, a Fed that's trying to drive the economy by driving up asset prices, and asset prices rise, rich get richer, and so long as those asset prices keep going, we can watch this process. But I think watching now, particularly the first line in falling oil prices, the failure to create demand anywhere in the economy is beginning to hit, and I'll stop there. Thank you for allowing the extra time. <laughs>